guys, I need to start. day to be in grace, <laughs> to be experiencing God's grace and to be in this place that we call grace. Um, Psalm, there's a verse in Psalm that I just love in uh, the translation of the voice. It says, um, may his praise be continually upon my lips, no matter the situation no matter the circumstance, may I always be found <clears throat> praising him. And that's a good word for today. Man, it's a glorious day. It's a beautiful day. It's the day that the Lord has made. So therefore, I will rejoice and be, and be glad in it. Be glad in it. So hey, <laughs> let's rejoice today because we are loved. We are loved with an everlasting, unconditional love. And that alone is reason to celebrate. Mm -hmm. All right? So you got your worship face on? <laughs> Ready to clap your hands, stomp your feet, dance a dance? <laughs> Let's do it. All for his glory and our joy.
the world that he gave us his one and only son to save for god so
Cameron was um, in preschool, when he started preschool, we started doing something uh, where every morning, so that he would know what kind of day it was and how to structure his day, um, we would say, okay, today's a home day if it, uh, we weren't going to school. And on those two days a week when he went to preschool, it would be a school day and Sunday would be a church day. So every morning uh, when we would get up, I would be, uh, hey, Cameron, guess what? Guess what today is? And he would say, home day or school day. And it's like, right. And so he would know how to dress and kind of what to anticipate for the day. Uh, one day I said, hey, Cameron, do you know what kind of today, what kind of day today is? And he said, no, but it feels like a birthday. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and I love that. You know, let's all have that excitement of a four-year-old thinking it feels like a birthday. So today, I hope it feels like a birthday because when we gather together on Sunday, we are celebrating a new beginning, a clean, fresh start. We're celebrating the resurrection. And sometimes it's easy to forget that that same power that raised Jesus from the grave, that same power is in us today. We had that same resurrection power. So no matter what we're facing, what kind of day we're having, whether it feels like a birthday or it feels like a trash week full day. of Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trash day, laundry day, oh, okay. We have that resurrection power within us. So let's keep it alive in our hearts and in our attitudes. And when it's in your heart and in your attitude, it shows in your face. And it rubs off on everybody that we come in contact with. We just kind of like sparkle and leave a little bit of the glitter dust <laughs> on everything around us. And it's a nice mess to have that kind of glitter. <laughs> so let's just have God glitter all over us today, everybody that we come in contact with, so that when we leave, people think, Wow, wow, that was nice. I feel refreshed mm -hmm. instead of like, oh my goodness, what a drain, <laughs> what a drain that was. Okay. <laughs> so today we're just going to tank up on God's love, his grace, his goodness, his forgiveness, and then we're going to be little reservoirs that take that wherever we go and share it, spread it where we go. Um, so let's do some more singing today. <laughs> Holy water. <clears throat> Knees. 
spanking new from David Crowder. David like, Crowder. I mean, I mean, he released like a, two weeks ago, something yeah. like that. I mean, it's so uh, super fun. 
<laughs> Super fun. Thank you, Lou and the Shrimp Shack Shooters. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? And we're the biggest fans, yeah. Actually, the ones on the ceiling are probably the biggest fans. But <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody online. It looks like we're live and we're still live. <laughs> so um, I was going to say the technology gods have blessed us today, but that would be idolatry. So um, thankfully, technology is working today. Um, I'm sure that could be God blessing us. It could also just be technology working because I'm not ready to say that when the technology stops working, that's God unblessing us. I don't think that's how God always works. But we're happy to be here and live, and you're live with us. And so we're monitoring the live feed while it goes. And should it die, um, we have a backup plan. And so we'll go live straight away as, as soon as we can back on our Facebook page um, should it die, we, 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 it won't be looking or sounding quite as good, um, but that all already went down a notch as soon as I got in front of the camera. So, <laughs> all right. How's everybody doing? Good? Cool. Well, um, today's going to be a fun message, I think. Um, and, 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 and I just decided this morning while I was going over my notes that I think we're going to, after today do like a little one or two or three week mini-series. We're going to push pause in the middle of um, um, where we are in Romans and jump into Luke chapters 13 through 14, um, at least a portion of 13. I don't know right where we're starting in, in chapter 13, but, but, but we're going to go, go, go through a little bit of that and, and look at what the kingdom of God is like and what that means for us. So I'm thinking maybe a two-part little series. But, but anyway, it's, it's really fun. And today's message is called Minuscule Means. Minuscule Means. So let's, let's dive in to our message today from Romans in Context. God chose Moses to set his people free. Moses was a member of an enslaved and despised minority group. I heard a ping. Was that my ping or your ping? Okay. No, it's just any, any technology sound, I was like, what's going to blow up or fail? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> Still here. So God chose Moses to set his people free. And Moses was a member of an enslaved and despised minority group. He was an outcast and a murderer. God chose David. David was the youngest of his brothers, simple shepherd, a nobody. God chose Gideon. Remember Gideon, the littlest fella from the least important tribe to lead a tiny army against a huge enemy force. God chose Joseph, a young brother sold into slavery. God chose Daniel, a defeated exile. He chose Israel, a little insignificant nation on the global scale. Even the promised land of Israel is this little bitty bridge between the two cradles of civilization. I wish I remembered it exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's smaller than Rhode Island. I mean, there's, there's like, the, you know, the, the, they, they call it the Fertile Crescent. You've got Mesopotamia up here, right, with the Tigris and Euphrates River. And then you've got, then you got Egypt with the Nile. And then right between it, and then there's desert and the Mediterranean. And then there's this little bitty bridge of fertile land connecting the two really important places. And God chose that little bitty place as <laughs> the promised land. When God decided to become a human and establish his kingdom on earth, he did it as a helpless infant, a normal human, through death, even death on a cross. He didn't set up a power structure on the planet. He said his kingdom was actually not of this earth, and that's why his followers did not fight to preserve it through power and, in, and violence. Jesus chose a bunch of goobers, to be his disciples. Just fishermen. 
or <laughs> tax collectors. Then God chose a murdering persecutor of the church to be a missionary to the Gentiles and write like half of the New Testament. It's almost like God is almost always putting his power and love on display through topsy-turvy examples. Times when what the world called crazy, weak, insignificant, or irrelevant suddenly became the source of sanity, true power, purpose, and love. You can go ahead to our next slide. So here's today's message. Minuscule means and eternal ends. It's a good Baptist pastor right there. It's called alliteration. You can't have the Holy Spirit without it. God uses minuscule means for eternal ends. Um, those are actually two mites. Um, not the bugs, but the, um, <laughs> you, you remember the widow's mites? And actually, when I went to Israel... Um, you know, I had a limited budget. I was, I was a um, youth pastor. I think I just become, became an assistant pastor. And, you know, you don't go into the ministry for, for the money. So I had a, uh, actually got to go to Israel just for the cost of my tuition. And, and I was there. I had a little bit of spending money. And so I was very particular about what I was going to get as souvenirs. The most expensive thing I came back with was a widow's mite, a first century copper coin looks a lot like that one and it was 50 bucks and and someone in the audience can tell me if I got a good deal on that or if I got stolen but um, um if, if, most expensive thing I brought I couldn't even afford two of them they equaled about a penny for the widow Here, here's here's the story Luke 21 1 through 4 Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And that little, bitty, insignificant gift, a penny, speaks eternal lessons to us today. While the pile of money that the rich put out to esteem themselves and prop up an earthly power structure of the temple is all wasted. All that money poured into an institution crushed by the Roman government. In the economy of God, two mites are worth more than a treasure. In the economy of God, five loaves of bread and two fish can feed 5,000 people. You see, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. You seen a mustard seed? You can barely see it on the tip of somebody's finger. They're pretty small. It looks insignificant and dead. And it falls to the earth and disappears underneath the dirt. Nothing. And then it produces something surprisingly huge in comparison. See, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, the kingdom on, on, of earth is not like that. The kingdom of earth is like pomp and circumstance, a big, buff warrior king proving his power and might and exercising control over people. Not my king. So, we're going to look at the minuscule means that we're finding in our context where we are right now in Romans. Let's, let's remember our context of Abraham, who we're talking about, and then we'll dive into our passage from Romans. Go ahead to our next slide. Just very quickly, just want us to remember where we are in the story here. Creation um, happens, creation, fall, uh, flood, and Tower of Babel, and Abraham and sons. All this, we're, we're in the book of Genesis. Um, Genesis, is one, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 is kind of like the primordial history of the world. We've got creation, you know, and, and then uh, the fall with Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit. And then, and then you know, Cain kills Abel. Um, and then the flood happens because the Bible says that every intention of the heart of man was always evil continually. Pretty bad. And so the, the flood, it's a difficult passage. We tell it as like a, like a, like a, Sunday school story, like a, like a children's VBS story. It's, 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 it's rough, man. 
And have you seen footage of a flood? Um, and then the Tower of Babel, people say, instead of, of spreading out and, 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 and filling the earth and subduing it the way that God told them to do, instead of submitting to God's plan, they all gather together as one to make a name for themselves. Who has the name above all names? God, and we all want to have that name for ourselves. Anyway, Tower of Babel, and God confuses the language, and, and, and then, then, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen? There, there's, no, there's no story of redemption at that point. Has God done with humanity finally? He, he tried to flood, but he made a new covenant with Noah, right? I mean, he, we got kicked out of the garden with, with the fall, but God made garments and covered their shame so they wouldn't hide from him, so they would be in a relationship with him. There's all these acts of redemption after all this bad stuff, but after the Tower of Babel, there's nothing. What's going to happen? And the answer to that is Abraham. God makes a covenant with Abraham, not because Abraham's awesome. Abraham's father, Terah, worships other gods. And actually, I think it's in Joshua like 24. I think it even says that Abraham the father worshipped other gods before a, uh, 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 Yahweh moved to him. Uh, so, so it's not like Abraham was like this awesome, cool guy worshipping God. I want to see if that's what if, if, if I say. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made him us for me. It's in there somewhere, I promise. Uh... Long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terra, and they served. A, long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terra, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. So God took them, revealed himself to them, started this process of redemption, making a covenant out of just grace. And so uh, Paul's been making the point that God made this covenant with Abraham, and Abraham believed in it, and that, that faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, and that happened before circumcision. And so we are not saved by by, by, uh, a faith of... uh, uh, We're not saved by works of the law, by a law of works, but by a law of faith. And and, and because uh, some Jewish Christians in Paul's time were saying, if these Gentiles want to be saved, they need to accept Jesus Christ and start obeying the law. They need to get circumcised. They need to have the dietary restrictions and practice Sabbath. And Paul says, no, it's, it's Christ and nothing else. It's a law of faith. And that was even true for Abraham. It was counted to him as righteousness even before circumcision and like 600 at least years before Moses even came to the scene, led the people out of Egypt and got the law at Mount Sinai. So Paul's saying the law itself, Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law itself tells us it's about a law of faith and not a law of works. A law of works, do you know what that is? That's power play. That's that's the world's economy. I build up power with my works and I earn my salvation. But see, the kingdom economy is not like that. It's faith. You don't deserve it. But if you'll receive it, it's a free gift by faith, reckoned to you as righteousness. So that's where we are with Abraham. Let's dive into Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Romans 4, 13. Thank you, Ken. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring is that he would be heir of the world, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. (laughs) Why do you need a promise and faith if you earn it? (laughs) You, you, You don't need to trust God if it's something you earn. You put your trust in yourself and in your works. But that's not the point of any of this. It never was. For the law brings wrath. But the where, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, that's why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares in the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, 
since he was about 100 years old. Sorry for you guys who are about as 100 years old. About 100 years old. You know, as Paul said Abraham was as good as dead at that age. <laughs> kind of harsh, Paul. Um, 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 he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Let me just push pause for a second. If you know the story of Abraham, you know he actually did waver in his faith a time or two. And at one point, he wavered in his faith enough to take the advice of Sarah, they agreed together, that since Sarah could not bear a child and they're supposed to have offspring, that they need to find an offspring somehow. They got, you see, it was, they were just using worldly wisdom. And, and the custom of the day, we learn from, I think, these ancient texts found in Mari, that, that the culture in Abraham's time, and, 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 and perhaps even after Abraham's time, was that if you could not have an heir, you would either pass on your heirdom to a servant, which we get some of that in Abraham's story. He says, what, what's going to happen? Says, this, this guy who's, a, who's from Damascus is going to be my heir, my servant. And then later on, there's, a, there's another custom that you could have an offspring through a maidservant. And so Sarah said, here's my maidservant. Why don't we have an offspring with her? That just makes sense. That's what the worldly wisdom tells us is the right thing to do. Maybe, the, you know, we, let's just take what God said and let, let's, let's use worldly wisdom to figure out what it, he really meant. And so they did that. Later they found out that wasn't the right thing to do. Their faith, I think, his faith in God grew as his understanding of God grew. And so he believed in God even after massive failure. And that belief in God, even after massive failure, was counted to him as righteousness. And his faith grew, faith grew so much that in like I think Genesis 22, God tells him to go kill his son, the promised son, Isaac, that he had waited for. And Abraham's like, this doesn't sound like God. Well, this is Nick, the Nick version. Maybe I should just give you the Bible version. Whatever was going on in Abraham's mind, he grew to trust God enough to say, I'm going to do what you want to do. Either you're going to raise this kid back up from the dead, or I, I don't know. But he went to go do it. And sure enough, God stopped his hand and provided a substitution, sacrifice. So Abraham's faith grew. <laughs> At any rate, we do see that he had this unwavering faith at some point in his life, and that was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 23, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. God chose a semi-nomadic family with no land. I, th I think at the end, Abraham bought a parcel of land to bury Sarah in. Isn't that true? Isn't that what happened? That's all the land they owned by the end of the story of Abraham's life. He chose the semi-nomadic people with no land and no posterity to be the nation through whom every nation on earth would be blessed. He chose an infertile couple to be the father and mother of our faith. <laughs> and he waited until they were pushing a hundred to bless them with a child of their own. That's a dumb plan. That's a horrible plan. If anybody came to you and said, here's the plan, wouldn't you say, that makes no sense. It's illogical. It's unwise. <laughs> I mean, you know there's more options out there. Most of us don't have the faith to abide in that plan. We would do what Sarah and Abraham did first. Try to rationalize the situation through the world's wisdom. Put our own plan together. One that maybe makes sense. No one in their right minds would expect that other plan to work. All the best counselors of the day would tell us that plan is impossible. So instead of waiting for the promise to arrive through minuscule means, I, 
think we're all tempted to find a more powerful solution. So Sarah gave her maidservant to Abraham so he would make an offspring through her. But that child was not the child of promise, he was the child of power. Not the child of faith, but the child of works. So much of Christianity that I see feels more like a pursuit of a display of works and power instead of a patient, long-suffering faith in the promise. It feels reactionary. It feels afraid. It feels like there's actually a belief in failure. But rarely, rarely in history, if ever, has God used the power of the politics of the day to establish or further his message. And when his followers have sought to make that happen, it never ends well for the kingdom. Well, what about the kingdom of Israel? Boom! God had a nation, a kingdom, and used that power to bless all nations. Well, he kind of, but didn't really. We already talked about who David was and who Abraham was and how he established those people in the first place. But remember, also remember, it, it, there was a big part of, of, of the, the tradition that we have that, that says that God didn't even want them to have a king. That choosing a king was them rejecting uh, God as their king, wanting to be like all other nations, wanting to do community by the world's standards. And God is so gracious that he even adopted that rebellion and turned it into Messiah. And he did it through a king who died at the hands of the great kingdom of the day and the great religious people of the day. Let's also remember that that earthly kingdom lasted an entire 40, maybe 60, 70 years in any kind of position that would be called faithfulness to God. I mean, David, he sat on the throne for 40 years. Youth pastor jokes out the door. He sat on the throne for 40 years. But it took a while for the kingdom to actually be built up to the height of its glory. Solomon adopted it at the height of its glory. And of course, David had all kinds of screw-ups in the midst of that. Right? It's not like that was like, the, 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 it was the glory days, but the glory days were jacked up. It wasn't because of the kingdom that God was moving, or the power of David that God was moving. It was in spite of who David was. It was, it was in spite of the kingdom powers. And Solomon took all the powers and, and, and manipulated it all and then and, 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 and married a bunch of, 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 of foreign uh, women and, and, and then took on their religious practices and, and, and then the kingdom was divided and, 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 and the name of God was profaned among the Gentiles because of the kingdom. Let's remember the most evident picture of God that was given to us, Jesus, was the king of kings, and he taught us that true kingship is displayed by a king who dies for a subject who washes his subject's feet. Power and persuasion is not the same in the kingdom of God as it is in the kingdoms of man. And we miss that so much. And we try to co-opt earthly kingdom structures and apply them to our faith. I'm going to read an excerpt from this book, In the Name of Jesus, by Henry Nouwen the elders and, and, and a few other people in the, in the church who are reading through this. Um, I'm going I'm to read just, just a, a, a little bit from here. Here's how Henry Nowen puts it. You all know what the third temptation of Jesus was? It was the temptation of power. Satan said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world in their splendor. When I ask myself the main reason for so many people having left the church during the past decades in France, Germany, Holland, and also Canada and America, the word power easily comes to mind. One of the greatest ironies of the history of Christianity is that its leaders constantly gave in to the temptation of power, political power, military power, economic power, or moral and spiritual power, even though they continued to speak in the name of Jesus, who did not cling to his divine power but emptied himself and became as we are. 
The temptation to consider power an apt instrument for the proclamation of the gospel is the greatest of all. We keep hearing from others, as well as saying to ourselves that having power, provided it's used in the service of God and your fellow human beings, is a good thing. With this rational, rationalization, crusades took place, inquisitions were organized, Indians were enslaved, positions of great influence were desired, Episcopal palaces, splendid cathedrals, and opulent seminaries were built, and much moral manipulation of conscience was engaged in. Every time we see a major crisis in the history of the church, such as the great schism of the 11th century, the reformation of the 16th century, or the immense secularization of the 20th century, we always see that a major cause of rupture is the power exercised by those who claim to be followers of the poor and powerless Jesus. What makes the temptation of power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. Easier to own life than to love life. Jesus asks, do you love me? We ask, can we sit at your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom? Ever since the snake said, the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's knowing good from evil, we have been tempted to replace love with power. Jesus lived that temptation in the most agonizing way from the desert to the cross. The long, painful history of the church is the history of people ever and again tempted to choose power over love, control over the cross, being a leader over being led. Those who resisted this temptation to the end and thereby gave us hope are the true saints. Abraham and Sarah were the worst possible choice by any worldly standards, but God chose them, and by faith, not through the might of works, but by the grace and ministry of God through minuscule means. Well, look around you. The world has been transformed. This is how we walk in the footsteps of of our father Abraham. The pursuit of power and the world's politics seems more expedient. Love is a long game. Does that make sense? Real lasting intimacy is, is a long game. You, you can't make it happen in a moment and you can't manipulate it if it's going to be real love you can't mask it yet you, you can't force it it's, 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 a, it's, it's a it's a long game and it all it often takes submitting even when you're right when you know you're right it, it takes deciding to not prove that you're right and instead prove that you love To, to, to not to, 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 to lose a few battles to, to win the war of intimacy. Love is a long game. We fail at it when we start playing the short game. <laughs> so here's kind of a so what. God's minuscule means is the long game. <laughs> Look at how long God worked through humanity to draw us to the fullness of time in which Jesus came. I mean, look at how long he let his people stay in slavery. And, and that's even after the flood and Tower of Babel, and who knows how long after the Tower of I mean, how long after the flood did humanity repopulate the earth to have enough people to do the Tower of Babel? How long after the Tower of Babel did it have to repopulate to have Terah and Abraham? And then, God's playing a long game with, with all those people all that time? I don't know what that means. 
I don't know what, what faith meant, what, what salvation meant at that time. I don't know how God works in all that. You know, I, I know that he can draw, he's drawing thousands and thousands of Muslims to him just through dreams right now. Have you heard those stories? You should Google it. It's great. I know that, that Melchizedek, in the, in the time of Abraham, was, 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 was a high priest of the Most High God, and Abraham tithed to him. He wasn't a Jew or a Christian, but somehow he was in with God. So I, I know God can move to people, and I believe he has moved to people outside of what we know about through our own experience and even through Scripture. We don't know how he moved to Melchizedek. But I'm just saying, God didn't just like, poof, Jesus cross salvation, He's playing this long game with humanity, leading us step by step through the wilderness wanderings, through empty, a seemingly empty time of just a period of judges and no kingdom. Like, what's going on there? Through a, through a long time of divided kingdom with his people rebelling and, and letting his people go into exile and bringing them out of exile. 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. Like, like God is not pacing going like, I've got to do something, I've got to do it now. He, he, he's, he's this master strategist of loving intimacy. tell you a story of faith and some of my Baptist brothers and sisters might tell me this is a bad illustration and I apologize for anybody in the room that I want us to look at this guy's faith and what he did and not necessarily the substance of what he used but I want to tell you the story of, of this guy named Guinness in Mr. Guinness's day alcoholism was running rampant in his society like people were um, 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 uh, bootlegging uh, liquor like crazy, fermenting it in their in their in their bathtubs, and people would come and backdoor, and, and, and it was it was just it was just destroying the the poor uh, population of of, of 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 his day. And as a believer, he said, "I got I need I want to do something. I want to make a lasting change here." And so he brewed this thick substance with very low alcohol content to give these people something else to use so, to, to drink because you know back in the day the water wasn't great I mean, so, so, so he he wanted to make this impact and, 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 and he did and and, and his and, and, and you know he the, 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 lots of charity and all, all kinds of stuff but but but, but here, here's the point he, he, he was wanted to make this impact in, in, in the society at the time and so then he went and, and he signed a lease for the building that he was going to use to, 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 to continue brewing this and to, to, to help the, the community. And, and, and he signed a lease. Does anybody know the lease? Have you heard this story? The lease he signed was for 45 pounds a year. I don't know how much that was back in his day or what. For 9,000 years. That's the long game perspective of Christianity. I'm not just going to make a difference, an immediate difference right now, but I, I, I'm going to try to set things up because I'm not just thinking about the now. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about forever. We don't serve just for our time alone. We don't serve for our children's time alone. We don't have to make a change right now to protect our children. God will protect our children. <laughs> and if we set them up with great comfort by worldly standards, we may be doing the opposite of protecting them, teaching them to trust in the comfort and the power structures of this world. We serve to cooperate with God to leave a legacy for our children's children's great-great-grandchildren. And that legacy is never left through the means of the legislation of any of the nations throughout the history of God's people. Remember that law that Constantine passed? Uh oh, 
That's not what preserved the church, was it? That legacy is left in the transformed hearts of our families and communities. And listen, I'm not saying that it has to be either or, either focusing on our families and communities or engaging in politics in a republic, uh, a democratic republic as believers. It's not either or. But I'll tell you what I really do believe is that the political engagement of Christians on both sides of the aisle in America has chosen an either or approach. They may not admit it, but at the cost of relationships, they have pursued political power as a way to change things toward the kingdom of God as they see it. Earthly expediency to win immediate battles over the laws of the land of one nation, which is currently in existence in this eternal timeline of faith. You hear me say, having a political opinion is not evil as a Christian. I'm, I am, I am, I hope, responding to a gross form of Christianity that is worshiping the gods of this earthly, the powers of this present age. I don't want to think that I'm reacting against those Democrats that I disagree with or those Republicans that I disagree with. But I want to look at what the, how the Bible presents faith and what is going to preserve the church. And if every Christian throughout history sought to prever- preserve the church through the political powers of whatever country they found themselves in, they would not be serving the kingdom of God. But if every one of us would, as we develop political opinions about how this democratic republic is supposed to work as long as it lasts, If we would also, maybe most importantly, I do think, focus on a heart transforming to the likeness of Jesus Christ and and, and, and loving our family to that and loving our communities to that, having our hearts transformed together, moving in the community, trusting in the Holy Spirit to transform the hearts of our community, I think those are more lasting legacies of, of, of Christ's love than any legislation. I think we need a correction, but just a minuscule correction. It's a minuscule means. It's a big correction. But we need to uh, adjust away from the short game of political victories for current platforms of existing parties and toward an inter- eternal legacy of transformed hearts. Listen, listen. If we had a passion for that kind of transformation, like the passion for political victory that storms capitals and burns cities, a passion to display the sacrificial love of Christ to our family and neighbors, maybe especially our enemies, we'd be playing the long game with God. And spoiler alert, God's pretty good at the long game. So here's here's where I would call us today with this first message on faith, power, and politics. I would just ask you, and I promise to do this myself. Actually, I mean, I I feel like I'm in a constant state of doing this. Not that that makes me good. It makes me stressed out. Um, I would just ask you to investigate your life's passions, political stances, political engagements, and the importance you place on some of those things. And investigate the, p- the passion and pursuit you have to display the love of Christ to your neighbors and your enemies like Jesus did. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where your focus lies, where your faith lies, your trust. And make any adjustments that the Holy Spirit gives you, especially as they are in line, uh, only if they are in line with God's word spills out the story of his long game. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we love you. We trust you. I place my trust in you now that you would protect everybody 
who hears these words, that you would protect them from me, from what I understand poorly, what I communicate poorly. I believe in your word. I believe in the part that says we believe, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Lord Jesus, I'm not the authority over who the church is supposed to be. I'm not the authority over how we're supposed to act in this country. I'm not the authority. I'm not the authority of anything. And I, I pray that by your grace, your Holy Spirit would please go before me, behind me. Anybody who's heard this message, who's going to hear this message, that your Holy Spirit would guide them into truth. preservation, that its establishment is not dependent on our works, and it's not dependent on anything that we do or do not do, that you will build your church. And so, Father, I pray that we would grow to be less concerned about building your kingdom and building your church and preserving your church, that we could focus more on being your church that you have established, that you are preserving, that you are leading to your end, to your purpose, to your goal, that you have foreseen, that you have predestined, that no force on this planet, no nation on this planet, no political party on this planet can take away from. You, Lord Jesus, are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All things are held together in you. You are the fullness of God, and you have established us. You are preserving us. Teach us to be what you've established, to abide in your preservation so that we can participate in your work through faith. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. song of response and it's just that take this time to listen to god to the holy spirit and respond with a yes
Hey, um, man, I'm always conscientious of the tone in which um, I land a sermon. I think I've whined to you enough about how much I've dealt with shame in my life, how I feel like God is always mad at me and expecting me to live up to him, and I'm growing out of that. I've grown a lot, I think. And because it's it's a lie, it's, it's it's the opposite of what we've been learning from Romans, you know. And um, um, I don't ever want to project that. I sometimes still use that vocabulary and that tone. It's it's a great power move, you know, to make you feel bad enough to change, you know. And and that's but that's at the same time when I'm thinking about it, just a little, just a little, you get to see how my brain works. Um. I'm not going to preach another sermon, I promise. <laughs> um, um, but what I also think is, is man, sometimes we, we, we live in a culture of comfort and we think, oh, if, if I feel bad about myself, then, then I have some kind of psychological problem and i got to believe that I can dream and I can do it and, 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 and always feel happy and, or there's something wrong with me. And that's just not true either. <laughs> blessed are the poor in spirit. <laughs> you know, blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> sometimes mourning, M-O-U-R-N, mourning is better than laughter. Flippancy in the ways of the world, ways of the world, is not good. You know what I'm saying? And, and so I, I, I want to leave you with a general sense of, hey, releasing our power is good. It's freedom. You don't have to try to change the world. You can just let God change you and see what he does through that. That's freedom. It's great news. And at the same time, if you see that you've been living for yourself and you're mourning over that, praise God, because that mourning is a death. Mourning, d death is healthy. I, I, but it, it's a good thing to mourn that. So that you that means you realize that it's wrong and and, 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 and that, that is the precursor to resurrection into the new life of God, the death of your life, the death of your power, the death of your ambitions. That that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be free, be joyful with this message, unless mm -hmm. you need to mourn a bit. All right? Um, a couple of announcements. Um, 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 celebrate recovery is in full swing tomorrow night, Monday nights at 6.30. Um, guys, please remember that, that, that um, it's not just for if you have a substance abuse problem, addiction. It's, it, 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 it's, it's for your relationship hang-ups. It's, it's for the pain that you've had in your past. We Celebrate Recovery um, is, is not magic. It's not the only way to do what it does. It's not the only way to do church, but it is a wonderful representation of what being the body of Christ is all about, is bearing one another's burdens, confessing our sins to one another, and praying for each other that we might find healing. It's a wonderful way to do it. Um, and so it's open to everybody, 6.30, uh, Mondays. It runs till about 8. Would you say 6.30 to 8? 6.30 to 8.30 is kind of the schedule. Right up. Um, also, our Tuesday night um, Zoom meetings, we're... Um, re-meeting at uh, 7.30 on Tuesday nights. Um, time for us to connect if you need some personal interaction. Um, we're going to be more, uh, a little more focused on discussing um, content instead of just um, um, chatting. We've just mostly chatted the past two weeks, and we've got a plan for this next week to talk about some of this. How, how are we supposed to be uh, followers of our king in the kingdom of God in a democratic republic? a weird thing. So join us for, for that, that discussion. Isn't that what I said we would talk about? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then also, finally, um, and unless someone else has, a, has an announcement, is um, your uh, uh, contribution reports, if you've been tithing this past or last year, um, uh, they're, they're there so that you can use those for your tax filing purposes. They're on the, on the table. And if, and if you need yours, um, holler, at, holler at us. We'll find a way to get it to you. You can come by and pick it up at the, at the church office. Um, if you need us to melt to you, we can melt to you. Just let us let us know um, either which way. And we will have Lord's Supper next week. So if you're watching um, electronically, digitally on the Webernet, um, 
make sure you get your stuff together at your home so that you can have um, Lord's Supper with us. All right, any other announcements that I forgot from anybody? The Valentine's thing. What is that? I know, I know it's the comedy night. For, is it Valentine's night? The Amen? 13th. Saturday night, which is the, the 13th. 13th. 6.30. 6.30. And is, is, that, is, that, is that a, a physical visit here? Coming here to this room? Okay, here to this room, the 13th, mm -hmm. Saturday the 13th, not Friday the 13th, so it's safe. Um, mm -hmm. And it'll be a comedy night for like, and for like couples. For, or, or single people can come too, right? It'll still be funny. Yeah. RSVP to, to either Gene or himself, who, who is Mike. And do you have to bring somebody? Do you have to bring somebody? <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit to bring with you, hopefully you'll leave with him. Right? The Holy Spirit. Right. Um, also, the last, I promise this is the last. Remember to, to, to continue to tithe and give your offerings. <laughs> Someone in the back is yelling at me, remind people to give. Okay. And you can give um, on here in person or online. Uh, just go to graceventura.org and click on the donate. Deal. All right. Oh, I need to get my Bible so we can have our blessing. I know you think I'd memorize this by now, but my brain does other things and doesn't have space to memorize hunks of scripture at this point. That sounds really bad, but I mean, if you knew all the things that I was... Anyway, Father, we love you so much. I want to take this time to slow down and recenter on you for me and, uh, and, and for, for all of us so that we can receive this great blessing that you put on the pen of Paul whenever he was telling the church the great purpose that they have to proclaim the manifold glory of God to the heavenly places through the unity that you've established among them. So let us receive this blessing that we may walk in that purpose for your glory and for our joy. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit towards your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.